Hello there, friends and neighbors. This is me, Stella Hendricks. Thank you for coming back to my channel. Once again, it's so nice to see you. Well, today we're doing part two of January 66. Uh, we got through the Grace Kelly interview in the last one, and that was about all we had time for. So uh, let's pick up where we left off. The next cool thing in this particular Playboy is a short fiction written by Roald Dahl. Of course, I'm not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> it would take too long, but I think it's a really good example of the really quality um, articles that they had in the magazine, particularly in the 1960s. It was really the golden era for uh, content in the magazine, in my opinion. Oh, they're so good too at the cartoons. <laughs> the funnies. I love the funnies. Ooh, you're early. Wait till I take my stocking off. <laughs> I love body stockings. I recently discovered um, the, uh, the joy of uh, nude fish nets. I do burlesque and if you put them on, they cover up all your cellulite, all of your little bumps and imperfections. Like, you will look so perfect if you put on fishnets. Also, I found a fishnet thing that goes all the way up here, so it covers my belly. Oh, it's delightful. Anyway, pro tip for burlesque dancers, always wear fishnets. <laughs> They're your best friends. Those gilded galas. Is that gala or gala? I don't know. I hear people say it both ways, and honestly, I have no idea. I even know there's like gala apples or gala apples. Are those pronounced the same? Do they have anything to do with each other? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure a gala is a fancy party. And I love the idea that there are fancy party apples. <laughs> okay, this, this is great. I, I thought, John Held Jr., creator of an era, the satirist laureate of the 20s, he virtually invented the flapper and soon the sheiks and shebas were actually patterning themselves on his drawings. I somewhat doubt this a little bit. I think that the flappers uh, brought themselves about. I think that liberated women uh, found themselves loosening their corsets and rolling down their stockings and I think it was not created by any cartoonist or any man. I think it was a pure um, expression of their inner selves. But this guy has really great portraits, really great cartoons, and I'm sure that he captured the feel of the era. And like the Gibson girl, I'm sure that eventually there were people who were modeling themselves after his illustrations. But I kind of doubt that he invented it. All these cool Life magazine illustrations. What was the what was the periodical that Norman Rockwell, the Saturday Evening Post? This guy apparently uh, was doing covers for Life the way that Norman Rockwell was doing uh, Saturday Evening Post. Oh, this is a famous one. I love this one. Very Gatsby esque. Oh, I like this one too. Actually, I'll show you these ones. I was watching uh, some YouTube video about The Great Gatsby this morning and it was talking about uh, queerness in The Great Gatsby and I had never really considered that angle before. Uh, when I read The Great Gatsby I was Mormon and in high school and I hadn't like properly read the book through uh, since probably, well not since I had left the church, I did read it again because I love that book. <laughs> But um, it was really interesting, and I now that I've watched the video and everything, I'm totally convinced that Nick Carraway is a closeted gay man, and possibly Jordan Baker, the golfer chick. I think she is, and I have to I have to get this book and I have to reread it and like view it through this new lens of like, because um, back then you know when it was written you couldn't be out and gay, so I think they call that uh, queer coding. But anyway, super fascinating and adding this whole new dimension onto The Great Gatsby that I hadn't really thought about before. And I love reading 
uh, classics with a new twist. <laughs> so that's very cool. Of course, the flapper stuff always makes me think of The Great Gatsby, so. Okay, <laughs> have you guys ever heard of this song called Troglodyte? It's a hilarious song from, it's like, like a comedy song. I'm not even sure who wrote it. Just go on iTunes and look up Troglodyte. It's kind of like that song, Alley Oop. It's about a caveman, which is why this reminded me of it. <laughs> and it's just, it's absolutely hysterical. Uh, it was on, I, when I was a kid, uh, my family had this little rundown cabin up at Lake Tahoe. And uh, there was this old album called Goofy Greats and we loved it and it was like a vinyl um we had only a record player up there and all of our aunts and uncles old vinyl collections were all up there so oh we had the best classic rock and like really old school stuff anyway this collection of goofy greats was one of them and that's where i first heard alley -oop and like uh what's that snoopy and the red baron and a uh, surfer bird and um What's that one? Ahab the Arab? <laughs> it's all of these amazing songs, like goofy songs that were written in the 60s. It's wonderful. I highly recommend it. You have to look it up. I don't think they have that actual album anymore, Goofy Greats. I found, oh my gosh, it's in my other room. I'm not going to go get it though. Maybe I'll show it to you guys in another episode. Um, the actual vinyl album, like the same one that I had when I was a kid because after my Papa Dan um, got in a car wreck and passed away, unfortunately, the greedier parts of my extended family decided that um, family wasn't worth keeping the cabin and they would rather have the instant cash in their hand because they're just the loveliest people. So the cabin had to be sold and everything went with it. And at the time, nobody thought that the vinyl uh, albums were worth anything. And I'm sure they all just went to, you know, the junk. <laughs> I would kill for those things now, but anyway yeah hello my name is Stella I am the queen of tangents so the next thing we're gonna look at is uh, the Playboy Mansion um, they this is the original mansion in Chicago uh, most people are very familiar with the uh, Hollywood or Holmby Hills mansion rather um, this one was around for uh, before that mansion and then during that mansion and I'm not sure when they actually sold this one but I know that by the time Girls Next Door was being filmed uh, that it had been sold. So I talked about this a little earlier when we were reading some excerpts from a book by Surrey Marsh and uh, we will <laughs> read more of that actually probably next week we're gonna review Surrey Marsh's uh, uh, issue of Playboy and talk a little bit about her and about her book super interesting stuff. So, uh, I'll just read some of this. The first sight that greets a visitor to the Playboy Mansion is a seven foot tall modern bronze, bronze sculpture of contemporary woman by Abbott Pattison dominating the foyer. Throughout the mansion, Hefner juxtaposes the work best of the best both juxtaposes the best of both the old and the new with works of modern art sharing honors with medieval suits of armor a pair of which flank the entrance to the immense main room. So I showed this kind of before, but I'm going to do it again because I just think that is so cool. Oh, it was the Star Stowe episode. Yeah, I was talking about Star Stowe. Because she went to the Chicago mansion for her shoot. And this is Hef getting his hair cut uh, at his house. Which cracks me up because they also had a scene of a barber coming by um, in Girls Next Door. And look at this, this, look at this chick down here. Isn't she the best? Look at this hairdo going on. Who's blonde. <laughs> Amazing. You know what, these little pictures, I really should hold them up a lot closer to the camera. You get more of the feel for them that way. Um, oh, this chick's hairdo. I love the hairdo going on here. Several mansion bunnies have supper in the dining room before going to work at the Playboy Club a few blocks away. I bet a lot of the Chicago bunnies stayed at the house then, huh? Oh, this is all of their uh, latest technology going on in that room. Ooh, very up to date.
All right, he's on the round bed. Okay, this is a good one. Mansion guests enjoy plush accommodations like the velvet walled red room occupied here by a trio of playmates, Shirley Connors, Krista Speck, and Dolores Wells. And at bottom, girls relax on bunk beds in one of the four bunny dormitories. I think that sounds like it would be so much fun. I just started reading uh, Stephanie Heinrich's book. Ugh, I happen to have her hair. Super good. Super uh, happier than Holly Madison's book, but, and more details that are really interesting to me, but um, I'm not trying to diss anybody. Uh, but she uses the uh, expression at one point that looking at all the playmates laying out by the side of the pool uh, was like looking at a, at, uh, mermaids sunning themselves in a lagoon <laughs> and that totally reminded me of that scene uh, from uh, uh, Peter Pan right where all the mermaids are out there just sort of playing their harps and uh, doing their hair and just sort of being fancy in the pool and I thought oh my gosh that is so exactly what it's like I always thought of like the princesses the Egyptian princesses from the Ten Commandments uh, kind of hanging out and eating bonbons and grapes and strumming their harps, you know, on the banks of the Nile. But yeah, that's exactly, they're like mermaids in the lagoon. Oh, that's exactly what it is. Delightful and hilarious. Very apt. So, think about mermaids in the lagoon. Oh my gosh. Isn't that amazing? Look at her. Ah, I love her. Her especially, I love this girl underwater. <laughs> um, I'm down in Florida now and over in Miami, there's this, uh, what's it called? The Rec Bar. It's inside of some hotel, some beautiful hotel. I can't remember what it is, but they have an underwater mermaid burlesque show uh, Medusa Serena is the head um, mermaid there. I would definitely like, like just Google that. It's so cool. And all the mermaids, they have social medias. They're gorgeous and talented. It was one of the most original and fun burlesque shows I've ever been to. And I am a connoisseur of burlesque shows, just so you know. <laughs> so that's it for the mansion for today. I love it. This was a very interesting article, the Parisians and the Germans. Um, it talks, well, I'm just gonna read the first paragraph. When the English and Americans liberated Paris, many of them were surprised to find us Parisians less thin than they had expected. They saw French women wearing elegant dresses that seemed new and men in sports jackets, which from a distance still looked good. Only rarely did they encounter that pallor of the face, that physiological poverty, which usually signifies undernourishment. Uh, it just sort of talks about uh, how terrible the occupation was and how sometimes uh, expectations are subverted. And it, it's hard for me to really um, uh, summarize into words here, I discover now that I'm trying to do it, but it's a very interesting article. Um, written by Jean-Paul Sartre, Sartre. It's one of those French names that has the R-E on the end. And I never know how to say that exactly. It's like the word macabre. You know that word? I try to put the R at the end, but half the time I hear people say macabre, they just say macabre. And they don't put say macabre. It's such a little detail. It's difficult, I think, for English speakers to do that. <laughs> I don't know. Oh good, another illustration. This is hilarious. Oh good grief. The kids are home for the holidays. LSD for all. San Bomb Santa Claus. <laughs> Those darn kids and their protests. What do they think this is, America? What do they want, free speech? 
Okay, this, oh, yay! Okay, now we have arrived on the Playmate of the Month. Uh, unfortunately, this has been ripped out from the center, but I do have it, so that's good. A beautiful red head. Back in the 60s, before they figured out that winged eyeliner should go above that little corner in your eye, but she still looks beautiful. Maybe that was just the look they were going for. I mean, heck, what do I know? I'm glad that the Playmate profiles ended up getting longer. They really are the most interesting part of the magazine, I think. Maybe not the most interesting part. I mean, you see, there is so much interesting material in here, but undeniably, you know, it's the Playmates that made Playboy. Granada Hills, a 25 mile freeway jaunt from downtown Los Angeles is just one of 100 of a hundred hamlets that honeycomb <laughs> the circumference of the city of angels but the presence there of 18 year old charmer judy tyler has made it a very special suburb as far as we're concerned the only constant in the exploding la me megalopolis being being changed judy who bubbles with youthful vitality deems it a rare distinction to be a native-born Angelino. You know, that's exactly like Las Vegas. <laughs> Says our green-eyed teenage Miss, teenaged Titian Miss Tyler. That's a fancy word for redhead I found out recently, Titian. It's really wild. I'll meet a dozen people at a party and they'll all have come from Kansas or New Jersey or Indiana. Having spent all her young life under the bright California sky, Judy is a card-carrying, great outdoors worshiper. Horseback riding, swimming, surfing, going for a spin on a motorcycle, the whole Southern California fun in the sun kick. My only regret, Judy Avers, is that the climate being what it is, I haven't had much of a crack at winter sports. When she does make the indoor scene, Judy prefers simple pleasures. A hearthside corn popping session, devouring sausage and mushroom pie at the local pizza palace, pie do they mean i know some people call pizza pie but i thought that was like a new york thing and she's from los angeles i mean it was a 60s thing i can find out oh, whipping up a vet of most of coley what is that it's a good thing i don't have a weight problem i have the appetite of a truck driver <laughs> girl you're 18 just wait doing the discotheque bit and doing the discotheque bit Judy, whose face and figure would seem a sure bet to attract one of nearby Hollywood's talent scouts, did have a brief trigonomic fling with the flicks. As she calls it, I was four years old and had been taking tap dancing lessons. My folks thought I could be another Shirley Temple. They took me around to the casting offices and, as luck would have it, landed me a part as the daughter of Ida Lupino and Frank Lovejoy in a movie called The Difference. I remember having a number of great traumatic lines like, Good night, Daddy. <laughs> it looked as though I were on my way. Then we went to the preview. The first thing we discovered was that the title had been changed to The Hitchhiker. Then it came very obvious that the plot had been radically altered and, worst of all, little Judy was nowhere to be seen. They didn't tell them that before they showed up to watch the movie? Jeez. As they say, I'd been left on the cutting room floor. End of my Hollywood career. We have a feeling Miss January's last comment may be premature if the film ghouls are wise enough to tap their own natural resources. Head for the hills, gentlemen. Granada Hills, that is. That's nice. You know I am particular to redheads. And I totally love this like fireplace scene. This is probably one of my favorite of the uh, centerfolds. I say that all, I have so many favorites. But honestly, I, I legitimately do. They are my legitimate favorites. I have a hard time picking, you know, the top one or two. And honestly, life is so much more delicious when you have lots of favorite things. <laughs> oh, here's a few more pictures of her out with friends. So we'll put her back in there. Oh, this is a hilarious another. They were they did a really good job on the illustrations in this one too. Oh, 
Nice defensive move, Miss Mullins. <laughs> Let's see, let's see, what else do we have in here? Oh, you guys are in for such a treat today because one of the greatest things about January uh, issues is that it's the Playmate Review. So we have all kinds of beauties in here. Mm -hmm. And I can't read all of them, so I'm just gonna read like the first sentence out of all their introductions. Hmm, but this one is, that one's just talking about all of them. We gotta find her. There we go. Last October, our photographic attention focused on the poolside pulcheritude. Oh, I remember that word. That's a fancy word for beauty. Of 22-year-old Allison Parks an able-bodied aquanaut who teaches tiny tots to swim in her family's Glendale, California backyard pool, and an off-hours flying enthusiast who has logged several solo hours aloft since she, since she first adorned these pages. I used to teach little kids how to swim. Oh, that was like my fave job. <laughs> Here he is, our Nick, lovely. I love those 60s hairdos. Aren't those like flip outs just hysterical? Pretty Pat Russo, a chestnut haired Connecticut Yankee who migrated to Florida's sunnier shores two years ago to pursue a cotton tailed career, earned centerfold honors last November after adding appealing dimensions to our previous month's pictorial coverage of the Bunnies of Miami. Oh my gosh, I love her. I moved down to Florida, and if there were any Playboy clubs, I would totally try out for them. But there are not. Alas, there are Hooters, and I am going to keep applying to them, and hopefully I will get hired one day. Won't that be a delight? Oh my gosh, I'll show you all my Hooters wear and everything. If I get hired, y'all will hear about it. Y'all will never stop hearing about it. Okay, so here are two more. <laughs> Look at her hairdo. The hairdos, you guys. The hairdos. Friends and neighbors. I love these hairdos. <laughs> so we have Miss March Jennifer Jackson, a 20 year old who was tripling as a Chicago bunny, a part time college undergraduate, and a freelance advertising model. And Lanny Balcom, Miss August, a former Chicago cottontail and Playboy College Bureau distaffer? Distaffer proved the comeliest of colleagues when she followed up her appearance as last year's April cover girl by adding her august charms to the august gatefold. <laughs> I need to like figure out how to read this kind of like story like story time style. Miss December, Dinah Willis, 20-year-old Dinah, was a letter-perfect candidate for Centerfoldum's Holiday Honors, who wrote us from Hobbs, New Mexico, to inquire if there was any chance of a small-town girl becoming a playmate. Oh, that's cute. Sally Duberson, Miss January, a Baltimore-based rabutet. <laughs> rabutet. What the heck? Does that mean bunny? I think so. When she received the nod as our New Year's playmate, 23-year-old Sally Duberson has since returned to her native New York, where she is completing her curriculum at a local school for would-be for would-be designing females. Like fashion design? For would-be designing females? What is that? <laughs> and Miss September, Patty Reynolds. September's reigning Miss, Patty Reynolds, spent her Playmate prize money on a tour of the European equestrian scene. Cool. Where she picked up many a timely tip on how to improve her jumping technique for the upcoming season of Midwest horse shows. Good for her. Horses are legit. Horses are so much fun. I'll this chick on the, on the ladder. I love her. Oh, I love her too. There's this fabulous picture of uh, Mama Cass. What is her name? Cass Elliot? 
I know she didn't like being called Mama Cass and so I feel bad. From the mamas and the papas. Mama Cass? Is it Cass Elliot? Ugh. But anyway, there's a nude picture of her in a field of daisies. And before I die, I am going to get a framed version of that picture up on the wall because I love it. <clears throat> Maria McBain, gorgeous gall. Gall. They said G-A-U-L. I don't know what that is. A multi-talented miss who hails from the south of France. That's what it is was working as a Los Angeles dental assistant when she first graced these pages last May. Miss April Sprightly, Miss Sue Williams, who became the shortest subject in Playmate history when she uncovered her four foot 11 beauty last April, has lost all traces of her latent tomboy tendencies since signing on with American International Studios and taking subsequent cinematic bows in how to stuff a wild bikini and sergeant deadhead what is how to stuff a wild bikini <laughs> i don't know what that is but i'm gonna find out that's amazing okay and miss july a red-headed california co-ed with keen hazel eyes for a career in ballet our pirouetting july playmate double times through a daily schedule of art courses at Pierce College and afternoon lessons at Natalia Claire's Ballet School in North Hollywood. I wish I was a ballerina. My mom was pretty opposed to dancing, so I never really got to take proper classes and stuff. And if you don't do it from a young age, you really aren't gonna go so far with that. <laughs> but with burlesque dancing, I just like to uh, support all of my performances with a little bit of some kind of classical background. Um, they are mostly striptease uh, in burlesque, but there's a lot of dancing if you want it to be. It's very much individualistic and I try to put as much actual like ballet and jazz and technique into my acts as I can. Certainly not necessary, but certainly something I'm passionate about. Don't worry, we're not done yet, friends. Miss June, Belgian-born Heidi Scott, is a heady or Heidi? I'm going to say Heidi. Part-time model for Hollywood fashion designer Charles Gallet and full-time filmic hopeful made everybody's June more joyous with her playmate appearance. Miss February, our favorite Valentine, was classically constructive native Californian of Greek ancestry, aptly surnamed St. George. <laughs> Pardon moi. Why do I always have hiccups? That was funny. Okay, this is just a beautiful painting by Leroy Neiman. I had to write that down. This is a picture of New York City around the holidays. It looks kind of like a Jackson Pollock, but I quite like it. It's kind of like a Jackson Pollock meets um, Monet, <laughs> right? Or maybe Van Gogh. And on the other side, another work of art. This is a Vargas. It's a Vargas. Alrighty, let's see. Oh, I was, I was the wrong one to mark. Okay, this one, Going Naked on the Riviera. I, again, I can't read all of this because it'll take too long, but this is a very interesting and hilarious article. Uh, one thing that I kind of miss from the 1960s, uh, not that I miss, I mean, I wasn't born yet, but one thing that I really like about these things from the 1960s is how descriptive they get when they talk about faraway places. Um, today we have so much, you know, camera and the internet and this, and it's easy to imagine yourself in different places. But back then, um, the spoken word was much more of a utilized tool and you can tell in how adept they are uh, at describing things. <laughs> I'll just read a couple uh, lines out of here. We are all born nudists. Some achieve nudism in later life. Some have nudism thrust upon them. The author of this article is one of the last. Oh, did I tell you? This is called Going Naked on the Riviera. <laughs> what it's really like, what happens and what doesn't on France's much publicized Ile du Levant, 
mecca of nudist sun worshippers. Also, I don't speak French, so I probably uh, like destroyed that, but <gasps> look, it's another peekaboo. How delightful. Okay, let's see. As soon as one leaves the central area, the minimum is shed and le nu integral is a fact. The sensation is a strange one and makes one aware that the mystique that the American nudists have built around their cult is based on a lie. One might even call it a bare-faced lie because it is only lying that the real motives of nudism can be glossed over. This is just hysterical. Also, I think one reason I like this article so much is because I was raised Mormon and I discovered up at Lake Tahoe there are a couple hidden nude beaches and uh, one time I was on a date uh, with a gent who I really wanted to impress <laughs> and I took him to the nude beach and I had only been there once before and I had not uh, gotten up the courage to take off my bikini even wearing a bikini for me at the time uh, it took a good bit of courage uh, but I went down there and I really wanted to impress this guy and I really wanted to show him like how, um, I don't know, worldly or brave or like how sexy and I didn't care, I guess, cultured or something. I don't know exactly. I just needed to be like, maybe I wanted to be shocking. I'm not sure. But uh, I led him down the beach and I was like, oh yeah, this is the nude beach. And I popped off my bikini and my clothes like I had done it a thousand times before. And it was all, it was all a show. It was bravery. And uh, he was like, he told me later that he wouldn't have been brave enough uh, to get nude himself if I hadn't done it uh, and encouraged him. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was the first time I ever did that. And he laughed at me and he said he thought I was an old pro. And I said, oh good, cause I was pretending to be. <laughs> delightful times oh no okay so I love Playboy generally um, I think it's important to be able to criticize your idols however and don't ever really hero worship anyone there's no such thing as absolute scripture no one's gonna be right all of the time and no entity is gonna be uh, admirable all of the time case in point I know it's just a joke but it's not a fucking funny one Adultery? My God, Millicent, surely you don't think this young thing is an adult. <laughs> Hilarious, Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, let's let's not have pedophile jokes, shall we? Gross, dude. Gross. Okay, bad job, Playboy. The fuck. <laughs> Moonshines, quicker and liquor. <laughs> Look at this. This is so funny. Oh my god, I love it. I love this hillbilly man. Also, I love moonshine. I am a fan of moonshine. I like the taste of it. I know that it just tastes like like a blast in the face or something, but I I think it's interesting. I like it. It's so strong it kind of takes your breath away. I think that's uh, exciting, maybe? I don't know. What you really need to make in your life is moonshine pickles and moonshine maraschino cherries. Literally just dump out the juice and pour in moonshine and let them sit for like a week. My favorite treat. You'll never guess what I forgot for the first time in my 20 years as a gun bearer. No, I think he's done for. <laughs> By the way, I took care of the elevator man. Do we love her robe? Oh my gosh, Catherine Delish just came out with these new, well, not just, but she came out with these new marabou uh, feather robes and they are truly epic and fantastic. I will have to get one of them. Okay, these ladies totally remind me of the wives from uh, Goodfellas. It's the first real piece I've had in years, what with Mike in jail and all the kids in reform school. <laughs> okay, a couple more illustrations. We're almost done. Darling, I just love the way you put Santa Claus back in Christmas. 
Aw, to have one's own personal Santa Claus. Everybody needs a Daddy Warbucks. I don't give a damn. It still needs nutmeg. <laughs> Hooray. My other wives don't understand me. Aw, poor Cody Brown. How did he get into this magazine? <laughs> oh. All right, last one, here we go. I think Miss Meadows has had a little too much to drink. No, I think she had the perfect amount. Well, that is it for this week's uh, Playboy review. That was January 1966. I had to split it into two because it was so interesting to me. Uh, let me know if it was too long-winded, if there's any, if you mind me going on or splitting it into two. Uh, please tell me if you have any uh, particular issue or playmates that you want me to review, your personal favorites or something. Um, and I will get to that as soon as I can. So thank you again for stopping by, friends and neighbors. I truly appreciate it. And I will talk to you again uh, next week.